Hi everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, CIP Mini Summit. Uh, this is second Mini Summit for us. Uh, there are uh, more than six people. Thank you for uh, joining this project. Uh, so this project focused to introduce what CIP is doing. So first talk is uh, introducing CIP, uh, CIP and the speaker is Ursula from Zenith. So welcome. So Thank you. Thank yeah, you. And yeah, and the second speaker is, is Yoshitaki Kobayashi san, uh, who just welcomed, welcomed you. you. So we will, so give, we will a give a very brief, very brief introduction on what uh, CIP is doing. Uh, the long uh, version, the long version uh, was so the, so the long story was told on Monday in our talk. I think you can still see this online. And uh, so we will pick some of the slides uh, we showed. So we are talking about uh, development of systems which really are used in, in industry and in, uh, in, um, in civil infrastructure. So I, I thought I could click on the slides directly, but of course I, I just noticed that I have to advance them. So on this slide, you see some examples uh, of transportation systems, energy systems, which are built in power plants, energy distribution, um, or building automation, uh, industry automation. And uh, those systems have several requirements in common, which are not addressed by typical Linux distribution and, and uh, software stacks. So first of all, uh, they have to be industrial grade in the sense they have to work reliable 24-7. Uh, Some need to fulfill functional safety requirements. Many systems interact with the physical world. So we have real-time capabilities to be uh, fulfilled. And uh, a big question is how to support and maintain these systems for a long time. These systems typically live 10, 15 years and uh, there are systems, for example, in the power generation area, which, which live up to 40, 60 years even. And um, so not only hardware-wise, but also software-wise, these systems have to be maintained. And this leads me to the third point, which is security, which is tightly connected to this. We have to keep the system secure. This means we have to provide security patches. Uh, we have to update the systems. And um, this is, was maybe the motivation of founding CIP, uh, which is now consisting or which was founded in 2016. And what we do basically is the following. We are building a base layer, which is used by different companies to build their own Linux distributions on top. And uh, we started small, focusing on the Linux kernel and uh, focusing on the long-term maintenance, and we will learn later what evolved out of this. So there is uh, automated test infrastructure, there is uh, build tooling uh, behind that, which is harmonized for, for all these companies. And we are working also on, uh, on extending this to, to add additional package, uh, packages to, to build really the base layer putting packages on top then in the different companies. And this looks basically like this. We to take the lower part and you see this on the right side out of CIP. And uh, then we add our domain specific or company specific extensions on top of this. Okay. Um, just so. All right. So um, I hope you can still hear me. I I I, I mean, yeah. I'm dialed in by a phone, so I had a call in between. <laughs> um, okay. Um, from my uh, from this uh, from this side, uh, I direct uh, yeah, into this. What currently we are doing? So this is for our for technical focus stuff. And there, as you can see, uh, there are lots of uh, technical topics are there. Um, but uh, since we started the CIP, uh, we have currently uh, so focusing to realize the CIP base layer. So we prioritize technical topic uh, one by one. 
and uh, the first uh, topic was uh, super long term support uh, because uh, our use case mainly uh, focusing uh, to use uh, such kind of system for more than 10 years or 20 years. So, and then we uh, extend this focus to the uh, current part for the real times um, and the step by step. So, we we currently doing uh, six activities a year. And uh, each topic uh, relates to our uh, key aspect, uh, industrial grade and sustainability and security. So um, to, um, we have a technical steering committee uh, to prioritize what we, are, we will do and we currently do and what we should do. So um, but there are uh, six activities focusing for each technical aspect. And today, um, so we have four sessions uh, from uh, each uh, activities for this. So uh, to realize the CIP base area, uh, we also have a strict uh, policy. And uh, the policy is upstream first policy. Um, to create CIP base area, uh, we use, uh, of course, we use Linux. And Linux main line is our upstream. And currently, we uh, focus to um, create super long-term support kernel, uh, which means the stable uh, kernel team is also our upstream. So we contribute first, then um, um, yeah, pick um, that kind of output uh, to CIP uh, to create our base layer. So this is actually a uh, Structure uh, what we currently doing. So, and today um, we have uh, four technical sessions after this introduction. So, first uh, session is uh, related to uh, mainly focus uh, kernel team. So, kernel team focused to create a CIP uh, super long term support kernel. Um, which includes uh, some ex uh, extra uh, features. So current team, um, yeah, Masashi Kudo uh, present uh, current teams. And then we move to um, uh, actual use cases. And me from uh, Renaissance uh, also present uh, to the uh, current use cases. And then um, we move to uh, our CIP security work group topics. So this is our, um, yeah, today's um, agenda. So, so uh, just concluding our brief introduction. So currently, we currently are focusing to create open source base layer. And this base layer hopes to uh, realize industrial grade and also sustainability. Um, so to ensure uh, this kind of key aspect, uh, contribution and collaboration is uh, our key activity. So let's see. Um, if you are interested in this, uh, our activity, uh, please consider to join to realize our sustainable product. So thank you very much uh, for your attendance. And uh, from now on, um, I. Uh, I would like to take uh, one um, uh, one questions. No, uh, there are uh, no questions. Maybe uh, that's fine. So, um, so if you, so, if you need uh, this kind of slide, yeah, uh, I, you know, we put uh, to the uh, website. So, please. So if you delay, uh, don't worry about that. So the next speaker is Masashi Kudo from Kanel Team. So please welcome to Masashi. Uh, Yoshi-san, uh, thank you very much. Hi, welcome to CIP Mini Summit. This talk will discuss about CIP kernel team. If you have watched my talk on Monday, thank you very much. If you have not, uh, please don't worry. I'll cover full stories about CIP kernel team activities 
from the talk on Monday. Before starting the talk, let me introduce myself. I'm Masashi Kudo from Cybertrust Japan. I have been working on software development in IT and network areas for more than 30 years. I had acted as Open Daylight Ambassador and currently act as CIP Kernel Team Chair. I'm located in Japan, so let me give this talk from Japan. CIP kernel team started four years ago. Since then, the team has steadily worked and improved processes to sustain the infrastructure of civil platforms. So in my talk, I'd like to explain what the kernel team's activities are. Also, I'd like to explain open source tools which we de developed to facilitate our activities. Then let me start with CIP kernel team updates. Primary goal of CIP kernel team is to provide CIP SLTS kernels for 10 plus years by fixing versions to fulfill the required level of reliability, sustainability, and security. There are two kernel maintainers, one kernel mentor, and two kernel developers in the team. While we are highly motivated to work on the project, we don't think we can achieve the goal by ourselves only. We definitely rely on outputs from upstream projects. Therefore, CIP adopts the upstream first as a development principle. The upstream first principle allows patch commits only if those patches are already in the upstream. By following this principle, if a desired patch is not in the upstream yet, this patch should be accepted by the upstream at first. Therefore, it may take time to introduce the desired patch to our project. But it enables us to share our outputs with the upstream. At the same time, the risk of conflicts can be eliminated. CIP is aiming to sustain target systems and devices during their life cycles, which are very long by their nature. So the upstream first principle is essential to achieve our goal. For CIP kernel team, upstreams are Linus mainline and LTS. We collaborate with upstream projects. Before using our, their outputs, we upstream what we have and don't keep them locally. As marked one, contribution is our first action. Feature upstreaming is done by CIP member developers. On the other hand, CIP kernel team contributes to upstreams in more general manner. We developed open source tools in order to work on contributions effectively. I will talk about those tools later. As marked two, use is the second action. We use LTS kernels to release CIP SLTS kernels. For those releases, automated testing acts a very important role. So, CIP kernel team is closely working with CIP testing team. As marked three, integrate is the third action. By integrating those SLTS kernels with CIP core packages and additional packages, industrial systems or devices can be developed and maintained. I'm going to elaborate those three actions each by each. The first action is contribution. Because we use upstream outputs, we value the general contributions to upstreams in order to be fair. Therefore, CIP kernel team works on backporting of bug fixes and security patches to LTS. 
These statistics are the contributions by CIP kernel team to LTS. CIP SLTS kernels are based on LTS 4.4 and 4.19, but our contributions are not limited to them. Contribution counts differ depends on the length of each life. By summing up each contribution count, the total of our contribution is around 1600. The second action is used. We use LTS for CIP SLTS kernel basis. As just mentioned, CIP SLTS kernels are based on LTS 4.4 and 4.19. The first releases of SLTS 4.19 and 4.19 RT were done in 2019. We plan to maintain them until 2029 for 10 years. The first releases of SLTS 4.4 and 4.4 RT were done in 2017. And likewise, we support them for 10 years till 2027. Currently, SLTS 4.19 is released twice a month and 4.4 is once a month. It is because commit counts of SLTS 4.4 are reduced. SLTS 4.19 RT is once a month and 4.4 RT once every two months. So far, we have steadily released CIP SLTS kernels thanks to our maintenance by following release frequencies I just, I, I just mentioned. This chart shows how upstream releases are used in our SLTS releases. Both LTS 4.4 and 4.19 are maintained for six years by LTS project. Because CIP aims to maintain for 10 years, the rest of four years will be maintained by CIP. We made major releases in 2017 and 2019. So our major release frequency is once per two years so far. Another two years is going to pass and the year 2021 is approaching. So we started to discuss about new SLTS kernels. The third action is integrate. Precisely speaking, this action is not taken by the kernel team, but by CIP kernel users. By integrating the SLTS kernel with CIP core packages and additional packages, industrial systems or devices can be developed. CIP refers Debian for user run packages. If you'd like to use Debian source packages, you can use Yoct Poki as a build system. CIP core packages contain tens of packages, which may not be sufficient for the development of end products. So you can add necessary packages from Debian by writing recipes. Debian provides LTS scheme, even extended LTS. So these schemes can be taken in, into account for super long-term support, including user run packages. As I explained, CIP kernel team is actively contributing to upstream. Open source tools were developed to help this activity. Now I would like to explain those tools in this session. There are mainly three tools. Classify failed patches, CIP kernel sec, and CIP kernel config. In this slide, those relationships are roughly pictured. The tool of classify failed patches filters and fetches backboard patches from the stable kernel mailing list. 
and classify the needs of backporting in CIP stable kernel. The scope of the backporting is based on CIP kernel configure repository. Another two is CIP kernel sec. The CIP kernel sec tracks the result, uh, status of security issues identified with CVE IDs in mainline, stable, and other configured branches. The scope of the backporting is based on CIP kernel config repository as well. So CIP kernel config is used as a gate for go no go decisions. By the way, I just mentioned CVE. CVE stands for Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures. Let me elaborate each tool in the following slides. The first tool is CIP kernel sec. You can find it on the GitLab. The CIP kernel sec is a vulnerability scanner. It gathers CVE information from multiple upstreams, such as the stable kernel, Ubuntu kernel, and Debian kernel. The result can be referred through both web interface and command line interface. The kernel team mainly works on CVEs affected in kernel 4.4 and 4.19 and may backport the specific CVE commits to the stable kernel. The CIP kernel sec provides a simple graphic layout and the users can get detailed information through web GUI and you can see in this slide. Next tool is classify failed patches. This is also on the GitLab. The stable kernel only accepts patches related to bug fixes or security fixes. Therefore, the patches in the stable archive are vital to be reviewed. This project tracks the status of stable patches and classifies patches into two categories. One is already applied and another is to be applied. The CIP kernel team reviews them and may backport the specific commits to the stable kernel where applicable. This is an example of outputs of this tool. The upper side shows the examples of already applied patches. Each line starts with applied. The bottom, line, uh, bottom side shows the examples of patches to be applied. Each line starts with to apply in this case. And the last but not the least is CIP kernel config. This is also on the GitLab. This repository collects kernel configuration from CIP members. To define the maintenance scope in CIP kernel 4.4 and 4.19 respectively. This is also the maintenance baseline for CIP kernel sec and classify failed patches as I mentioned earlier. So let me conclude today's talk. Our goal is to provide SLTS kernels for 10 plus years by fulfilling industrial requirements. In order to achieve the goal, CIP kernel team follows uh, upstream first principle and contributes to upstreams. We are steadily releasing CIP SLTS kernels by taking advantage of LTS, and we developed CIP open source tools for contributions. Okay, that's all from me. Uh, thanks for listening to my talk. Are there any questions? Let's see. Okay, I have a question. Uh, let's see. 
Uh, one question uh, is, uh, being the newcomer, how to contribute in CIP kernel? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is a very good question. Uh, uh, I I uh, uh, do not prepare, but uh, uh, if you uh, can sub subscribe CIP dev mailing list uh, by going to the CIP uh, website, and uh, there are a bunch of emails uh, uh, exchanged, and uh, you can see how it uh, the uh, CIP development is going. And every Thursday, uh, every Thursday, uh, we have a IRC channel meeting. And uh, by joining such IRC channel, uh, you can also understand the status of uh, CIP development. So uh, please, uh, 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 come to the CIP uh, website and see uh, the information uh, listed uh, on the web. The next question is, uh, usually how soon can CIP release a patch? Once a CV-related upstream kernel is released. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is also a good question. We are trying to incorporate uh, CV, uh, patch release uh, quite often. Uh, as you can see, uh, we are releasing, uh, for example, uh, SLTS 4.19 uh, once uh, per two weeks. That means uh, we are catching up uh, the late, we are trying to catch up the latest LTS and by if uh, uh, CV patch security patches are incorporated in uh, LTS uh, by delaying the, uh, such uh, two weeks uh, maximum, we can incorporate such security patches. Uh, do, do, do I have more time? I have one more question. It is said that some security fixes are not marked as security fix, but how CIP kernel maintainer will pick up such fixing? Yeah, uh, this is, uh, yes, uh, this is actually a problem. But uh, uh, currently, as I showed uh, in my previous slide, let's see, can I see my slide? Uh, we are uh, not only uh, collecting such information from uh, stable kernel, but also from Ubuntu and Debian. Uh, they are marking uh, patches with CV IDs. And uh, by uh, corresponding those uh, information, we are trying to incorporate uh, CV security patches into our CIP uh, or, uh, or even backporting to uh, LTS. Okay. okay, the next question is, can you elaborate on the CV tracking that is done re relative to upstream mainline kernel? Since uh, mainline does not mark or track, uh, uh, this is, uh, I think, similar question, I think. And uh, if my uh, answer is not uh, satisfactory, uh, uh, let's uh, discuss uh, later offline. What is method of doing security verification and research on kernel? Well, uh, Kind of, uh, security verification method is, as I mentioned, uh, this kind of uh, uh, CV uh, 
CV, uh, by, uh, through, uh, CV, uh, scanner, uh, this CIP kernel sec, we are trying to find, uh, identify the security patch, uh, which are needed to, for, uh, CIP kernels. Uh, at this moment, we do not use any special, uh, tools, uh, specific to security, security verification at this moment. Okay, uh, so time is running out. So the last question. Do you know who are currently using CIP kernel? Yes, actually, uh, of course, uh, CIP member companies are using, uh, CIP kernels internally. Also, actually, my company, uh, Cyber Trust, is releasing, uh, 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 Linux distribution based on the CIP kernel. And, uh, uh, there are several, uh, customers already using a CIP kernel. Okay. Thank you very much for, uh, such, uh, many questions and, uh, great questions. Uh, so, uh, probably, uh, I have to hand over to the next speaker. So, uh, Yosan, is it okay? Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Min from Renaissance. Uh, next, I will share my experiences integrating the CAB SLTS kernel into a fully flash BSB. And um, here, is the agenda. I will briefly introduce myself and the company and go some background information about the application field, our platform, the solution for HMI, and the relation between Renaissance and CAB. And next is the main part, my experiences, and it has totally seven items. And last, I will share some future ideas and Q&A section, thank you message, and some reference link for you to refer later. Uh, at first, I will go to the introductions. Um, this is me, I'm Min, uh, a senior staff engineer of Renaissance Design Vietnam, and I'm a project leader in the AZ Linux team at uh, Renaissance Design Vietnam, and we provide verified Linux package I call VLP integrating the CB SLTS kernel. I have 10 years experience in embedded software development and mainly Linux. And uh, at the end is my uh, contact email. About Renaissance. Uh, Renaissance is a short form for Renaissance Semiconductor for Advanced Solutions. Uh, our headquarters is in Tokyo, Japan. Our major platform are automotive, HMI, industrial, and IoT. We have more than 18,000 staffs all over the world. And uh, our major operations are research, development, design, manufacture, sales, and servicing of semiconductor products. And um, in all branches around the world, ABC, Renaissance Design Vietnam is one of them, and uh, we located in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. Our major platform are automotive and HMI with more than 800 engineers. We work for the design of semiconductor for both hardware and software aspect. And uh, next year, the uh, background information. Um, today, target is uh, the application fields for human machine interface, HMI block with 3D graphics and uh, video capabilities. We can see it in many uh, applications field like the uh, intercom, digital signage, and kiosk terminals, and many more. And to uh, satisfy these application fields, we provide the ASC platform. And uh, the platform here contains five factors. The first one is as it the platform multimedia processor. 
is the uh, family of 64-bit and 32-bit ARM-based MPU up to 7 cores with imagination 3D graphics accelerations and variety video processing up to 4K and other functions necessary for the uh, embedded devices in HMI type applications. And uh, we also have the evaluation kit with mass production sum. And uh, also the software side, we have the uh, very fine Linux package VLP that I will explain more, more detail in the later slide. We also have the uh, Linux development tool and also some software add-ons. About the um, very fine Linux package, uh, we have many components from the GUI to the multimedia to the secure middleware. And what we uh, want to focus uh, here is verify Linux package. We want to provide the evidence of our verification result. And uh, we also want to have a industrial grade Linux kernel with 10 or more years super long term support high reliability, security, and with real-time features. And CIBS LTS kernel can satisfy all these requirements. That's why we want to adopt the CIBS LTS kernel into our VLP to provide a fully fledged BSD. And um, Um, about the relations between CB and Renesas, um, because we want to adopt the CBS LTS kernel, so we also decide to join the CB as a platinum member. And we also propose our hardware to be the preference for the CAB. As we can see here, we have azc one M iWave Q7 development kit for MV7 and Renesas ZZ2M 96C board for the MV8. And we have many more. Um, totally, we have seven reference hardware platform from all the CB members and all cover the x86, M7, and MV8 architecture. And uh, next. Next, I will go to the uh, main park, my experience. I have totally seven experiences that I want to share. Um, the first one. Um, the first one is star first. Uh, the ideal development the IDO development flow starts with CAB kernel team upstream to the mainline and uh, LTS. Um, CAB kernel team here I mentioned is just the uh, representative because it's not just the kernel team who upstream the code, CB member and non-CB member also upstream. And this upstreaming includes Renaissance patches. Then the LTS will be used in CBS LTS kernel and CBS LTS kernel will be integrated into our RSS BSD.
and um, this is just the um, just the uh, ideal development flow. In reality, our Renaissance BSB team have to patch a lot by ourselves. And um, we have to patch a lot besides integrating the CBS LTS kernel into our Renaissance BSB. And we have to do that to satisfy the on-time delivery. Okay, and um, next slide, please. For the number two tip experience. For the number two experience, we gradually get the benefit. Um, after the first uh, patching for the next update and uh, super long term maintenance, we gradually patch less and less because the Renaissance patches already included in CBS LTS kernel and we can directly apply it. For example, for the first release, it took us 15 man months and for the second release, just 11 and for the next one until the stable phase around seven man months. Although these numbers are not real and just for example, but we can see the development here is reduced. And uh, next is tip three. We continuously get the benefit. Um, the development load is still the same, but now we focus on the bug fixing. Uh, in the past, we may have to self-investigate, self-solving or consider the impact for other components. But now we can directly refer to the mainline or the LTS patches. And if we have any similar issues with the solutions, we can easily consider and quickly apply to our BSB. And not just our Renaissance BSB, the customer of Renaissance also have the similar benefits. And additionally, if they want to support the latest kernel, they can uh, directly refer to the mainline and the LTS kernel instead of self porting. Uh, so the experience here is Renaissance and our customers spend less effort to fix bugs or to support the latest kernel. And next tip, uh, experience number four. Uh, we get long term benefit. I have five things to mention. The first one is if Renaissance and CB kernel team work on the same kernel. Take, for example, here is 4.19.72 uh, for CB10. Um, we have the patch from the Renaissance B, B team, and I call here the new B patches. And we have the patch from CB kernel team, I call here the expert patches, and both include the Renaissance patches. And by comparison, these two types of patches we can learn what are the experts do about the similar features. And also number two, by subscribing in the CB development mailing list, we can monitor or we can see a lot of expert discussion. And uh, number three, especially if the discussion is the, related to the Renaissance as the MPUs, we can directly discuss with the expert. And all of this have us a lot in this uh, developing our uh, patching and working skill. And also number four, I, we have the chance to attend a lot of open source conference like this CB mini submit. And also number five, we have a chance to speak at the CB mini submit here. And um, in summary, in summaries, uh, we have many chances to learn from and to work with experts. And that's how for our human development. And experience number five. Next, number five. Um, we want to go step by step. 
Uh, take for example, CPSLTS kernel have two support version, normal and real time. And Renaissance BSP want to do the same things, but we do step by step from verify normal version first. And then for the next, we add the real time with verify. And for the next one, we switch back to verify normal and non verify real time. By this way, we can support both, but step by step from easy to difficult and to stable phase. Next, experiment number six. We support one version at one time. For example, at October of uh, to, uh, 2019, for 4.19, we support CB12 for normal and CB10 for real time. And uh, for 4.4, CB38 for normal and 36 for real time. And for Renaissance, we want to integrate the uh, CB kernel to our BSP, but we choose just one version. 4.19, we choose CB10, and 4.4, we choose CB36. And this way, we have the unified support. The only difference between the normal and real time is just the real time pass set. And next is the um, experience seven. Uh, we release once every three months. Um, the kernel policy from CB, they release 4.19 twice a month, 4.4 once a month, and uh, real time twice a month for 4.19 and 4.4 real time once every two months. And uh, by release one every three months, Renaissance only get the latest update. And we also have enough time for one development cycle four or six weeks for porting, similar for verifying and remain for documentations. And this is for the whole development, the actual work for kernel is much less. And um, that's all of the experience that I have time to share now. So I go next to some idea for the futures. Uh, the near future, um, Renaissance will integrate the CD core package into our ABCD and we want to expand the number of packages in the CD core. And uh, for the far future, we may consider to the test automation security and maybe more. And um, thank you. Uh, this chance, I want to say thanks for the CB team who have worked for that so that we can integrate the kernel into our BSD. And uh, thank you, Linux Foundation, for preparing and support me to speak here. And thank you for all your uh, time for attending my sharing. Thank you. And uh, the last one is some reference link so that you can check later if you want to know more about uh, my experience today. And um, finally, in the Q&A sections. So do you have any questions for me? Uh, so the first question, what the biggest challenge in maintaining this BSB in long term? Um, until now, um, the biggest challenge is that um, beside the uh, working, we have to work faster and better day by day because in the maintenance, we cannot do the same work for a long time. We have to work, find what we have to do better day by day. And um, when I say patch a lot, uh, could be more specific. Uh, for example, at first, when the Renaissance patches, are not included in the CBS LTS kernel. So that means when we apply the uh, CB kernel, it's just the kernel itself on the ball support package for the on the driver for our uh, hardware are not included. So we have to work by ourselves. And um, what kind of uh, patches mainly for the uh, driver for the IP study on our device and on our board.
experience for uh, using a CIP uh, for after use cases. So the next speaker uh, will speak about security. Uh, security is more important uh, for industrial use cases. We use don't care about uh, to connect uh, devices on the internet, but now it's changing. So they are talking about how we ensure the security for uh, CIP uh, devices. So please welcome uh, Kento and Danish from CIP. So great. Hi, Kento. Thank you for inter uh, introducing me, Yoshi. And uh, thank you for attending CIP Mini Summit All. I'm Kent Yoshida from Lundesas Electronics in charge of the first part of this talk. And second speaker is Mr. Kumar, uh, Dinesh Kumar from Tosh Toshiba Software India. Okay, today uh, we would like to talk about activities of CFP security working group to achieve industrial grade security. In the first part, I will talk about the background, purpose, and activities of us, the roadmap and progress of the certification for IEC 6443 part four, and the survey results about technical requirements for IEC 6443-4-2. In the second part, Mr. Kumar will explain about our challenges for an open source project to achieve a secure development process to meet IEC 6443-4-1. As Yoshi mentioned, CIP is working to establish an open source base layer of industrial grade software through the activities of each working group. To achieve higher industrial grade for CIP products, security is one of key challenge. The security working group is launched in December 2018. And considering what can be done to deal with cyber attacks that's seriously damaging in the industry we are working on. As a project uh, to provide a base layer of industrial grade software, we must be serious about security needs with IEC 6243, which is the cybersecurity standard for industrial automation and control systems. As you know where uh, IEC 6443 was born by integrating the standards of major industries, such as plant, energy, uh, smart grid, and railway. In addition, IEC 6443 is a standard series for all control system players who are operators, system integrators, and component product suppliers. Linux is used in many of the component products that make up industrial automation and control systems. The IEC 6443 part four series, which is security requirements for component products, lists embedded devices, network devices, and host devices as examples of target product. This working group's mission is to provide open source base layer needed for developing products compliant with IEC 6443-4-2 security requirements, as well as to keep its security up to date. More suppliers take advantage of our solutions and get IEC 6443-4-2 to make industry more secure with CIP. For that, we are considering to create a platform such as kernel and package software to be compliant for certification, a guideline that shows how users can develop compliant applications using our platform, and a testing environment to be compliant for certification. We are a sub-working group of the CIP project and 
our activities are support, supported by the contributions of CIP member companies. Currently, six companies of the eight member companies are participating in this activity from Germany, India, Taiwan, and Japan. In addition to the activity report at the CIP TSC conference and the development conference at the IRC, we hold private conferences that is every other week conference and every week IRC. We should keep content in the paid standard in private. So we need to discuss with only uh, those uh, who had purchased the standard. This is the only reason why we hold the private conferences. But I know we are an open source project, so our activities should be opened. Thus, our de deliverables will be not limited. Like any other product of CIP, it will be generally shared on our GitLab. Okay, so next, I will share you the roadmap and current status. Our first task was to investigate the security requirements for the IEC 644C-4-2, which is our objective. And we selected some package software to meet the requirements as the investigation result. To get certified IEC 644C-4-2, it must be proved that the target software was developed in a secure process. So we are investigating how CIP can meet to IEC 6443-1 secure development process. This is a big challenge for an open source uh, project, but we need to address. We believe it is great benefits for many users that a universally shared platform guarantees those security. In addition, the result of our investigation should be reviewed with the certification body because there is a strict certification program in IEC 6443. About our activities for IEC 6443, part for certification, Please see our security working group, group wiki in the CIP wiki. As you not, noticed, our activities is related to all groups in the CIP project. Uh, software review procedure, how to keep a record of this review, providing test cases according to requirements, required functions for package software, and uh, so on. Yeah, of course, software updating procedure as well. Apparently, uh, we will be able to make a clear request after discussion with the certification body. However, we should start the security practices because it is necessary to clarify the issues through those actions. So uh, we have already started to discuss about a few security practice with uh, other team, such as JP Core and testing group. In details of this, uh, Mr. Kumar will talk to you in a second part. Okay, at the end of my talk, I'd like to share you the report of the, the investigation for IEC 6443-4-2 requirements. These numbers show what numbers of requirements are supported by about 20 package software we selected. As a result, we can provide a viable functions for 48 of 77 requirements of security level 3 of embedded devices. The base layer can support over 60% of the requirements that embedded devices and their software application have to meet. It will be a great advantage for many users, we believe. The result of this survey and our great significance to our activities. Okay. 
Now let's move on to the instruction uh, of uh, initiatives related to IEC 6443-4-1, Secure Development Process. So uh, it's your turn, Mr. Kumar. Hello. Uh, so first I will introduce myself. Uh, I am Dinesh uh, from Toshiba, India. Basically, I am working currently for uh, CIP activities uh, in security work group uh, where we are investigating IEC 62443 uh, 4-1 and 4-2 standards. So maybe uh, it's already explained about 4-2 uh, by Kent and uh, in this uh, second part of this session, I will be explaining about a uh, brief overview of 4-1 and uh, briefly, I will also update about our activities. So uh, by now, probably you can uh, understand that this is something like a unique initiative taken in CIP where we are trying to uh, get assessment uh, by IEC certification body for a open source project where we are having uh, like so many challenges in terms of in open source there are many things which are not documented there is no proper process and there are so many contributions uh, all around the world so whereas uh, in ic standards they expect many things to be streamlined documented and a strict process to be followed so in 4-1 uh, there are uh, total eight practice practices as mentioned here where uh, security management uh, practice as further sub practices like a uh, process should be defined uh, where everything is documented and there should be a uh, process to uh, deliverables like uh, whenever some scripts binaries are shared it is shared with uh, where end customer can verify the integrity so that kind of process should be in place and in a specification of security requirements uh, further there are many things the specification expects like uh, threat model uh, should be defined and all the input output uh, to the product as well as boundaries of the product process should be defined and in secure by design again it expects uh, secure design uh, principles, uh, secure coding uh, guidelines to be followed. Uh, secure implementation uh, practice uh, further elaborates on implementation part uh, where uh, we'll see in coming slides the challenges uh, we face in open source and how as of now we are uh, planning to uh, explain. And uh, then next is security verification and validation testing where it is expected uh, that all the security requirements which are defined uh, should be properly validated and tested. There should be proof uh, for all the things which were identified in threat model, how they will be mitigated. And in management of security related issues, uh, the specification expects like how uh, issues will be handled like if the any if any issue is reported by end customer what is the channel and how it is made sure that the fix goes in a secure way then there are uh, practices of uh, security update management and security guidelines uh, which again defines certain guidelines to be followed so overall uh, this 4-1 mainly focuses around a uh, secure development now, as we can see, uh, when a product supplier wants to comply for 4-1, uh, it applies to uh, four categories, basically applications, embedded devices, network components, and host devices. In CIP, uh, we are currently targeting embedded device category as well as uh, network device category. Okay, so in uh, so now we will see, as I mentioned, 
in open source there are a few challenges which we uh, face and uh, before that we will see what all the key elements in 4-1 so the scope of 4-1 is uh, limited to developer as well as maintainer of a secure product it uh, doesn't uh, specify anything about the usage and all those things it encourages security concerns to be proactively addressed at an early stage in product life cycle so that uh, accordingly mitigation can be planned. It encourages to do threat analysis uh, exhaustively based on the huge case and considering all possible scenarios product is going to support. Do the risk assessment uh, to establish trust boundaries for process data and control flow and a thorough security verification and validation testing has to be performed. Okay, so uh, we'll see uh, what are the key challenges uh, in 4-1. Uh, considering open source nature of CIP and not being an end product, so these are the challenges uh, like development, environment, security. So as we know in open source software, the development happens across the globe and different people contribute. And guaranteeing uh, the security of development environment, access of the code is a bit challenging. Next one is following secure design principles. Again, uh, being open source, or software there are uh, many participations and contributions where different people try to follow different uh, guidelines and uh, different design principles so uh, making sure uh, how it is achieved in open source or software is again a challenge then defense in depth measures uh, when the product is deployed somewhere so what kind of measures are expected uh, by original manufacturer of the product and what is actually available in the deployment environment. So that is something a bit challenging because CIP is not a specific product. It's a platform. It targets many huge cases. The next is security implementation review uh, like what all uh, security fixes come uh, from all around and what all security features are implemented so they should be reviewed thoroughly before including in the product a uh, defining threat model so again uh, CIP being a platform uh, it's a challenge to define threat model and its boundaries because uh, it tries to uh, address many huge cases uh, but still uh, we are trying to uh, define a generic threat model and as it was mentioned in the first part of this session, we are currently uh, discussing with the certification body and probably by uh, end of this month, we will start gap assessment and then one by one each of these challenges uh, plus how we are uh, targeting to meet these uh, challenges uh, will be discussed. Then we will come to know where is the gap. Okay, so as of now, uh, basically based on the investigation and uh, based on our understanding as well as uh, based on the clarifications received with the certification body, uh, this is the approach which we are thinking how we will uh, apply like for development environment security, uh, we will reuse existing open source infrastructure such as combination of uh, private and public repos where uh, there will be limited uh, limited privilege to merge code and uh, every merge will be reviewed uh, before including in the product. So even though contribution is done from uh, all over the world, but uh, the control will be through merge requests. So it will not be like anyone can modify the code. Following secure design principles, uh, we plan to document how to protect open interfaces or restrict access in a generic way. But again, uh, once we discuss these things with certification body, we will have more specific things in place which can be further reused by end product owners. Defense in depth measures. 
so here ultimately the overall uh, objective is to reduce attack surfaces in all possible ways so our objective would be to uh, basically document uh, general measures because uh, uh, finally in the end product they have to be specific about these things so we will be like generic and security implementation review uh, for this we have uh, dedicated uh, uh, reviewers like in cip kernel we have kernel maintainers who review fixes uh, before taking in cip and same kind of process we are planning to apply in cip core where uh, we will uh, start including fixes uh, first by reviewing uh, then uh, defining threat model uh, this will be like generic and based on the discussion and inputs received from a certification body uh, we will try to have for uh, this in place also uh, well so usually uh, there is always a question like once any product is certified by IC then how it is maintained and what is its validity so this slide explains about it uh, once the certification or assessment is completed uh, during the certification certification body defines change control process which has to be followed for uh, any kind of changes and uh, once the changes are followed sorry uh, change control process is followed for all the modification and uh, the changes are limited in nature uh, then it can be maintained and according to uh, process defined by IC after three years certification body audits all the past changes and if all the changes are found in accordance with the change control process certification is renewed or uh, invalidated if it is found uh, if it is meeting the change control process or not so this way uh, the certification can be maintained for long term okay so uh, this slide uh, basically explains uh, recently uh, we have included uh, debian security packages which were required to meet uh, 4-2 uh, security requirements so we are testing those packages and this slide explains how can you take the CIP source code and uh, security branch where we have included uh, specifically Debian packages which will meet security requirements and then uh, it can be tested. So currently uh, we are developing uh, test cases in the next slide uh, here you see uh, currently we are developing lava test definitions which will be used to automate uh, testing of security requirements uh, as it was already explained in uh, CIP kernel session uh, already there is uh, automated testing is happening for CIP kernel uh, using lava framework and same things uh, like in same infrastructure we are planning to integrate uh, these lava test definitions for security requirements once this development is uh, completed so uh, anyone who wants to verify the security requirements they can simply run this uh, test cases and it can be uh, seen through a uh, web ui how is the uh, security requirements or uh, test cases are passing or failing so uh, currently uh, these test definitions are under uh, development So you can see how uh, as under development test cases uh, now uh, it is this screen is showing the web UI of uh, Lava interface where uh, when I submitted this uh, slide uh, we just started that time and uh, there were just three test cases which passed we were verifying locally uh, now we are slowly uh, working to move this into cloud and this uh, test results will be available as part of entire CIP test uh, results. Well, so uh, one of the requirements of 4 one is how the security issue fixes are tracked and 
how it is uh, released so to meet uh, those requirements basically as part of open source project uh, the best way is to track cves and uh, basically include uh, a certain level of uh, 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 vulnerability fixes in uh, cip automatically so we are currently investigating uh, various tools so that we can automate the process of uh, process of including CVE fixes automatically at build time. So the tools uh, we are exploring CVE check tool, CVE checker and SW360 uh, framework. And once this is finalized, uh, this will be integrated. Uh, and in the build time itself, automatically it will check the CVE fixes. And before that, yeah, this is, uh, these are the requirements from 4-1. Uh, where CVH will help us to uh, achieve these requirements like before making product release uh, critical security fixes should be incorporated and made available to end user rece receiving notifications for security related issues. So as per our understanding uh, these requirements can be met by CVEs because in open source projects we don't have anything uh, proprietary and rest of the things uh, probably will go to end product owner uh, to meet these uh, requirements. So this is the uh, generic way of achieving this requirement. However, uh, as it was mentioned earlier, we will discuss this uh, with certification body and we will see whether this, uh, this can be used to uh, meet the requirement. Uh, this slide uh, probably you have already seen during a CIP kernel uh, presentation. So in CIP kernel already uh, there is a tool CIP kernel SAC uh, which is already uh, tracking the CVEs related to kernel but uh, those are currently limited to only CIP kernel and uh, our target is to uh, include the uh, CV tracking tool even for uh, user uh, packages. So as part of CIP core, uh, we are investigating uh, other CV uh, tracking tools which will be integrated and later we will see whether they all can be consolidated or we may continue to track uh, CIP kernel CVs separately and uh, user package uh, CVs separately. So this will be decided uh, once we uh, conclude our investigation. Okay, so for this one uh, being uh, mainly secure development uh, focused standard, it expects uh, several documents to be in place and uh, even process should be documented. A lot of documents such as design documents, user manual, uh, security requirement documents, security capabilities documents. So those kind of documents should be in place. So uh, to achieve the requirement of uh, this 4-1, uh, we, we have finalized uh, to use GitLab in a restricted way where uh, we will keep certain documents uh, will have restricted access because they will have IEC uh, standards information which cannot be made public and certain documents uh, would be kept in public repositories which will be available for anyone. So uh, how we are going to do is uh, basically maintain version of each document. Uh, these are again the requirements for this certification and restricted access of some documents such as secure design, IC information documents and uh, version uh, could be compared of different uh, version documents. So based on this, we decided to use uh, GitLab uh, and have two repositories, private and public repositories. So there will be only few documents in private repositories and most of the documents will be part of a public repository. Uh, it will be maintained in CIP GitLab. And this is already, this plan is uh, already approved in CIP TSC meeting. So uh, we soon we are going to create these repositories and we will start putting the documents uh, here. Uh, 
Okay, so this is the comparison of if someone selects CIP as a distribution and non-CIP distributions. So what all the advantages associated with CIP and non-CIP distributions? So the uh, biggest advantage we can see dedicated kernel maintainers for SLTS up to 10 years, which is not available usually in other uh, open source distributions. Which, which is a big relief, uh, especially considering uh, the effort required to maintain uh, so many packages, so many uh, frequent releases. And uh, next one is uh, IEC 6244-4-1 uh, and 2 assist platform. So this is also another unique initiative taken by CIP members to, uh, uh, to work for IEC standards and uh, get the platform assist. So here, as uh, as uh, we have explained, uh, for four dash two, we have already included uh, certain Debian packages, and for four dash one, we are working. So we will have for uh, secure development process and required artifacts in place. So these things uh, are not available in other open source distributions. And the third one is close monitoring of CVEs at user and kernel level. So here uh, you can see uh, already in CIP kernel it is in place and for uh, CIP core we are currently investigating. So it's not like something not available in other distributions but here we have a dedicated uh, support and, uh, and the most important thing is the support lasts up to 10 years. Extended support from Debian ELTS for specific packages. So uh, based on the CIP members request or, or the requirements from further end customers, sometimes CIP members uh, agree to support additional uh, Debian packages and based on the agreement, uh, it is again requested to Debian and uh, CIP basically does the funding for this and uh, as end result, uh, this extended support is again for additional packages. And uh, regular automated testing on multiple SOCs uh, with published test results on kernel CI as well. So uh, as it was highlighted during CIP kernel session, uh, the CIP kernel is currently regularly uh, released and tested on Lava uh, flame, uh, framework. And uh, at multiple SOCs, uh, currently it is being tested. Uh, there is a list of supported reference hardwares on CIP uh, wiki page available. And if you are interested or any whenever uh, any uh, CIP member wants to add additional reference hardware, uh, after certain process it is added and all the CIP test cases are executed on the reference hardware. Uh, and last but not least, strong support from big players of embedded system industry. So you have seen in previous sessions, there are all big players uh, who are supporting uh, CIP and uh, we are having a good support in terms of uh, technical as well as uh, uh, all kind of support from community as well. So uh, what is next from CIP security uh, perspective? So uh, next step basically uh, we are about to uh, finish contract signing uh, with one of the uh, certification body. So we will start the gap assessment for compliance with uh, IEC 6244-3-4-1 and 4-2. So all the artifacts of CIP including uh, current repositories, uh, documents, and the process which is followed will be reviewed uh, with uh, certification body. And uh, certification body will uh, prepare a report which will highlight the gaps to achieve the uh, these uh, requirements of these specifications. And accordingly, uh, again, we will work to meet uh, those gaps. And uh, then we will go to our final certification. Uh, for this, again, we will uh, work with a certification body and initiate final CIP assessment for conformity with IEC 4-1 and 4-2.
once uh, final assessment is completed uh, result uh, will be published in terms of reports guidelines as well as additional packages required to uh, meet uh, 4-2 and 4-1 requirements which can be used by uh, suppliers and they can uh, basically using uh, these artifacts the cost of end product certification can be reduced drastically because uh, uh, as per the discussion with certification body the certification requirements which are already met by CIP uh, end product don't need to again meet those requirements even they will not be assist so there will be uh, in CIP we are trying to meet as many requirements as we can so there will be only fewer requirements which will be very much product specific and use case specific which has to be met by end supplier so once the assessment is completed all these artifacts will be available uh, for uh, anyone to utilize and take full advantage of uh, CIP or uh, security activities so So this is the list of references you can get further information this is the CIP mailing list if you are interested you can join the CIP dev mailing list where all sort of discussion happens and you can get all the information and please join the uh, project to share the effort and there are uh, you can see the uh, different uh, URLs to get further information related to security you can get complete information and we will be periodically updating this space to reflect the progress of assessment with the certification body. So please uh, keep frequently visiting this space to get the uh, latest updates. So that's all uh, from this session. Uh, thank you for attending this session. And next we'll take the questions. Yeah, uh, we have one question and uh, I answered to that question. Uh, yeah, the question is, uh, there is a research project. So if my company plan to use CIP corner and also needs follow safety procedures, uh, is there an existing example or suggested process to develop using CIP while following ELISA at the same time? So. Yeah, it's a great point. And uh, now, uh, mm -hmm. currently, we focus uh, uh, we we focus IC six four four three. So uh, yeah, we don't uh, focus sa safety specific uh, use case uh, currently. Uh, but uh, yeah, I guess. Uh, our CIP uh, kernel is used in the product for safety uh, related systems, I guess. So, uh, yeah, uh, we believe, uh, yeah, there are not competitive relationships. So, uh, we hope so. Uh, I think that's all. So, yeah, one minute yeah. remaining. So, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we are. We would like to pass to Yoshi. Thank you for attending this session. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for attending CIP Minisamit for this time, and um, thank you very much for all speakers. Uh, so we uh, today we focus to introduce our activities, uh, especially for Kernel team and also CIP working team. So. Uh, we mainly focus on critical topics for our life. So if you have uh, interest for our activities, uh, please join uh, mailing list or our um, chat. So we are free to um, yeah, accept anyone to join. So thank you very much for everyone. And thank you very much for all attendees for CIP Meeting Summit. And I'd like to see you uh, next time. So let's close our mini summit. So bye-bye, everyone, and thank you very much.